Hi, Working Preachers. This is Caroline Lewis. Just wanted to remind you that the Working Preacher Fall Campaign is ending soon on October 31st. You still have time to make an impact for preachers around the globe. Go to workingpreacher.org to make your gift during the campaign, and your gift will be matched dollar for dollar. We need your help to continue providing resources to church leaders like you. Thank you for supporting this vital work. Don't forget to make your gift during the campaign to unlock a free ebook titled Digital Jazz. Digital Jazz is a workbook to help preachers apply media and technology appropriately to their proclamation of the gospel. Thank you for partnering with us in this ministry. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This is a podcast for Reformation Sunday on October 30th, 2022. We have another podcast on this week for the texts. Uh, if you're following the Ordinary Time um, segment of the Revised Common Lectionary. But for you Reformation Sunday fans, the first reading is as it was last year and the year before and the year before that, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, Psalm 46, Romans 3, 19 through 28, and John 8, 31 through 36. I'm assuming these haven't been the readings for 505 years, which is the, it's, is the 505th anniversary of the Reformation. But it would have been if the lectionary had been that old. <laughs> it seems like it's the, been. I, I count the Reformation from Jan Hus. Ah, just right. saying, back in the 15th century. It just seems like it's been 505 years well, I that we've Jan been Hus talking about these texts. Or, <laughs> if Jan Hus had written some hymns or had a seminary named after him, we might be planning this all differently. But right. Nevertheless, right. this is primarily, I think, didn't Reformation Sunday begin mostly as a Lutheran thing? I know it's celebrated yeah. more broadly across other denominations, but yeah. Oh, you're going to claim that one too, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think people know I'm Wesley Presbyterian. Got, Wesley got his pietism from the Lutherans, so I'm I'm with you. <laughs> and the Presbyterians yeah. got criticized by the Lutherans, so I'll just hang out there. Well, but the two, Romans well, the two were, of you were, could just like I'll just wax eloquently about the Reformation and well, when we get know, to as, the, psalm, as the lone Lutheran on the podcast. You're welcome to <laughs> sing when we get to the psalm. Uh, John 8, we should probably begin there. You know, there's a great Reformation text in Luke 19 on the other podcast in, in terms of a great text to talk about Reformation themes. But, you know, this one I think is chosen um, mostly owing to the language of freedom and this idea of being set free from a kind of servitude. I, I want to make sure we don't simplistically equate that with either Judaism or Roman Catholicism in any century, but uh, important, important language to lift up and to help people put a theological lens on to understand what we mean when we talk about freedom. Well, and particularly in the Gospel of John. So what does it mean? What does it mean to be free in this Gospel? And so that would be one that would be one way to articulate that. And I think, uh, as I think about that concept in the Gospel of John, particularly in this context where Jesus is, this is where the polemic between Jesus and the and the Jewish authorities really comes to uh, really comes to a head. And so, but it's it's about as as we see in verse 33, it's about relationship and that, and we are descendants of Abraham and tying into what is it that establishes one's relationship with God and how is that, how is that set up? And so part of this is a, it's a freedom for all people to be in relationship with, with God through Jesus. And so it's uh, it, it may be not necessarily um, a, a freedom from uh, a freedom from a kind of oppression. That's not really it, but it's re it's really tied into as well to verse 34. Very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. It's freedom from sin. That is freedom from 
absent the absence of God. And so the way in which the preacher can articulate that uh, as a way to think of what does being a reforming church mean, it means looking for the ways in which perhaps uh, we uh, we need to be persist per persistent in how is it that we uh, allow that freedom for all people, or how is it that we work toward that freedom for all people to have a relationship with, with God and with Jesus, and what are the ways in which we prevent that? And so mm -hmm. Reformation is a way to remind us of what uh, of what fundamentally is at stake for the Reformation is that uh, that relationship with God that is not necessarily prescribed by certain uh, constructs, but really is free in Jesus. I don't want to get rid of the idea of sin altogether, but I know that John's take on sin is different. And so I mm -hmm. wonder if I was preaching on this this week, I might use language of estrangement or alienation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in some yeah. ways, especially because the yeah. emphasis here is to be brought into relationship, the idea of yeah. being a child who has a place in the household forever, which is not liberating language for a lot of modern listeners, but so to help rebuild what that, what that looks like and what that means. But what's the, I guess, what's the opposite of that? The, what's the opposite, the opposite of? of well, of having that kind of place in a household forever. That's why I used estrangement as a kind of mm -hmm. contrast. I think mm -hmm. estrangement is a good word for the current context we're in. Um, you can stretch that beyond a household. Um, we wear certain uh, modifiers, and yet we feel estranged from our political uh, parties. We feel estranged from... Um, whatever variety of communities we're, we're a part of, that could be denominational, that could be our local congregation, that could be, um, you know, what it feels like to be a citizen in a particular uh, city or uh, a particular nation. I mean, that estrangement language, I think, is probably a good one. Um, and then the opposite would be this promise, uh, which may take us away from an argument, uh, or um, let me say it positively, may invite our listeners to engage in the argument that is happening where uh, the, um, uh, the leaders are not recognizing uh, their own identity as children of Abraham, as descendants of Abraham. They're saying that this is who we are, and yet they follow that by a statement that's not true. You know, we've never been enslaved by anyone, enslaved by anyone. And yet the the very metaphor of what it means to belong to God is God remembering the cries of Israel while they were enslaved and setting them free where they received the um, Ten Commandments, which is an invitation to live a more abundant life than one would have where they can't acknowledge their ancestry, honor your father and mother, where you can't um, value life um, because a slave's life is worth little, where you can't, uh, where you are always worried about where the next thing is coming from. And so you would steal, and if not steal, at least covet. Um, so that, 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 that sense of what does it mean to belong means to be a part whether it's family, which I think is the most powerful belonging uh, in terms of metaphor, but whether it's family or community, uh, we're all estranged right now and we need the promise of an abundant belonging. I think maybe too, a key to this is, uh, it is some of the other language in this passage where you have, if you it translated, if you continue in my word, but if you uh, it's if you abide in my word, and of course, word here is uh, is Jesus Himself, and and so maybe going on going in the direction that you're going, Matt. What's the opposite of abiding, right? What 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 would it mean not to abide or not to dwell or not to be in this relationship with Jesus? And then, and you will know the truth. And the truth is here, not abstract truth, but the truth of God is revealed in Jesus Christ or the very Jesus himself. And so 
so much of this passage is based on language that we've already had in the Gospel of John that that just circles around and around of of this abiding, you know, grace upon grace relationship. And so the way in which we can think, well, what does it feel not to have that, or what does it feel, uh, and what would it what would it mean to be free from uh, being lost or being um, uh, free from uh, a sense of not belonging? That I think that I think that would resonate with people. I like that. And especially talking about the word, I do wonder if that's Jesus himself or if it still is partly his message here. Although I don't know if I want to divide those two things. Yeah, I don't know if you can. either. <laughs> but the idea of abiding in that word, I, again, if I were, were preaching on these texts, I would talk a lot about how so many theological reformations throughout the history of the church have come from out of somebody's deep engagement with scripture or community's deep engagement with scripture around the real issues of their day, their time, and renew that call for, for people today. My folks are, you know, reformed and always in need of reformation and always reforming. And, but to talk about what is, how is that call today, given those kinds of estrangements that Joy cataloged earlier, the, the cure for that is perhaps a callback to scripture or a call back to wherever we understand God's word to reside in community and to, and to do the hard work together of, of reasoning, of studying, of, of testing and discerning. And the way in which God's word is a vehicle, if you wish, or a, a resource to what, what reconciliation looks like or what, uh, what, uh, bringing back together looks like. Uh, what does it mean to live in community? What does it look like to live in community? And so the way in which scripture speaks to that over and over again, fundamentally being in the community of uh, with God, but and then the, the community, the body of Christ, but a community as believers. And so gives us the language and the, and the vocabulary and the imagery, uh, imagination for what that looks like. And that's in that sense, it's critical to abide in the word <laughs> helps us with that. Shall we move to Jeremiah? We shall. Do we have more on, on Romans. I feel like we've, we've worked with this text at least two or three times in the last few months. I was going to go back and look it up, mm -hmm. but, but there it is. And again, I think with any, any time we talk about the reformation or, or, or the reformation becomes the setting for particular texts and particular theological themes, we want to be careful of our, our tendency, our historical tendency and current tendency toward anti-Judaism and, and not to set up Judaism as some cheap foil for a text like this, as if, mm -hmm. you know, there's an outdated religion that now has become obsolete and now a new way that this is a Jewish text. This is Jeremiah is speaking a, a Jewish hope as mm -hmm. well. And whatever Jeremiah might have understood the fulfillment of this promise to look like, in Jeremiah's own time, soon after the exile, who knows, is is open ended. I mean, obviously, for Christians, we have a vested interest in a particular reading, but but, but not to make it too simplistic. I guess is my my opening appeal. Oh yeah, and I think too that fundamentally here, what we have is Jeremiah speaking about an absolute confidence and trust in God's capacity for a new covenant. And uh, and a re uh, you know a, a, a reconnection of relationship and a, new, a reestablishing of that covenant with God, and so how is it that that even that kind of language can help us think about what does reformation mean? You know what does it? We I think sometimes we uh, we have a tendency to focus so so uh, myopically on on. The, the church being reforming, but we have a reforming God too. And, you know, a God that's, that's recasting or re, you know, recovenanting and reforming us into God's image. And so maybe that could be a direction, a homiletical direction too, that, that Jeremiah offers us this, this conviction um, and this belief. And so we celebrate reformation, not because, We've been doing it for 505 years and we're supposed to do it. And, you know, you sing your hymns and 
pull out all the trumpets or whatever, but we do it because of a certain a certain belief in who God is and the character of God. And what is and what God is continuing to do among mm-hmm. us and with us. Uh, I, I really appreciate that, Caroline. Uh, we we can get caught up in the rituals of it and forget that we are marking something that is ongoing. Mm-hmm. And uh, Matt, as you were speaking, I was thinking um, there's sometimes, uh, uh, you know, we have this historical anti-Semitism, but there's also uh, sometimes uh, anti-Catholicism that uh, some, some groups will still hold to. And uh, if you Read this idea that Caroline has just named in terms of God's constant reforming, and I like to talk about uh, the forming of community, is that the promise to Israel was for the sake of all of humanity, uh, Genesis 12, looking back on Genesis 11. Um, But Israel was divided and yet came back together uh, in, in the sense of we no longer talk about, you know, the, the tribe of Dan, the tribe of Benjamin. We, we collapsed them all into one. And then at the Reformation, there was a division. And yet we can kind of lump ourselves as Protestants, Christians and Jews, uh, add um, Muslims in there if we're talking about the uh, Abrahamic faiths. But there's also this sense, if we're reading this text, knowing where it's going, so reading it a second time through, we know that eventually Jesus is going to pray this prayer that we all might be one. And that's the reforming happening all, happening over all, all over again. And so when we look at this promise that Jeremiah has made, and we see it in this new covenant that is Jesus, it is actually God being the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the new covenant that is being made is actually um, a reinstantiation of the original promise of God that we would be one in God. Would you say it's also, it's the same. Is there also something new about it? I mean, it's not, this isn't a reset or a restart. Right. It's the idea of yeah. God saying, OK, the old things hasn't been working quite right. I'm going to find a new approach that or, brings forth that same promise, that same love. Yeah. Or or I I don't want to say um, I don't want to say such a corrective in terms of the the failure of the old things. Um, I I would rather focus on the faithfulness of God who says, I don't care how many ways you avoid getting into this abundance I'm promising you. I've made a covenant and I'm going to keep it. And so reforming is actually a great word. And, And Caroline was referencing this. It's a great word because it's taking what is and just tweaking it a little bit. I mean, if we really play with what the word to reform means, it doesn't have to mean um, uh, abolish and start from from scratch. Mm-hmm. It literally means taking what exists and, and let's tweak it, though it's a little bit more than a tweak. Yeah. 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 Uh, Psalm 46, you're welcome oh. to sing, Caroline, if you'd like. Uh, right, this, is, uh, this is the basis of a mighty fortress, is it not? Yes, it is. Yes. The the language here strikes me, you know, some of these things about the earth changing and mountains shaking and waters roaring and foaming, I think. Yeah. And those used to be metaphorical, didn't they? (laughs) And now they're a little too close to the weather report, huh? Yeah. And especially. I suppose they always have been at some level. It's just so frequent and so much. It feels like it feels like the threat that the that the psalm understands it to be, doesn't it? Doesn't. Well, and then at the same time, you have that uh, an incredible contrast, you know, with that, you know, the earth should change, then the mountains shake, and the heart of the sea, the waters roar and foam. And, and so you have this, you know, tumultuous, these tumultuous surroundings, and yet the call to be still and, and know that I am God, which is really quite striking. And I think I would if I were preaching on that, I would do something with that. Uh, I would do something with, you know, what, what does it mean to sit in that 
in that tumultuous space and yet be called, you know, called to be still. And I really appreciated the commentary. I would direct the preachers to the commentary of how, you know, he points, he points, Jim points out that, you know, type Psalm 46 in the working preacher search box. And there are 11 other scholars who have commentated, you know, offered mm -hmm. commentaries on this, but, but it points to, uh, it, it, it points to the continuity of the word or the living word, uh, the way in which a, a psalm speaks into, uh, speaks into our history time and time again. And how is, it, how is it that people are hearing this psalm on this day in, this, in their particular contexts? And what are the, the, you know, what, what are the immediate community tumults? <laughs> Uh, of that the preacher is preaching into, but also, of course, our national and global tumults, and yet the call is to be still. So I think I would do something with what what is the effect of that, or what does that feel like to uh, to be still and know that I am God. Um, that's what I, yeah. And this this idea of the same God yesterday, today, and forever, in this particular text, I find it interesting that it's there's a specificity to it that at first glance you might not expect, or, or maybe I should just be confessional and say I don't, because when I think of the mountain shaking and I think of the heart of the sea, um, I, I get a little out of the reality of an urban life that is so central to my existence. And yet in the midst of these descriptions that could take me outside of the bounds of the city, it says, God is in the midst of the city and it shall not be moved. So there's a, a recognition of God's promise literally made across all of the earth, whatever that setting might be. And, and I find that promise uh, encouraging. Mm -hmm. Indeed, we need uh, probably several podcasts to get to the bottom of Romans three. There's so much going on in this, in this passage, but at least where would we drop in if this is where people want to go? Yeah, I think uh, I, I want to call people that are uh, before maybe we get into the specifics of the text, but one thing that I found just really helpful is the last paragraph of the commentary on the website of this uh, Reformation Sunday not celebrated as ritualized seasons, but as sacred days to remind and call people to embody the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, and, and, and that's what's at stake in Romans, you know, that, that this is, this is what, this is the qualifier. This is the, this is the litmus test for what it means to be a reforming church. And, uh, and that, that, that the reformation of really how we view the world and our expectations of the world happened in in that resurrection and and uh, as the commentator says that to commit ourselves to god's mission and ministry for justice and mercy and repentance and so maybe i think one of the things that the commentary does and in along with the text is helps the preacher give language to not just celebrating the Reformation, but doing and being the Reformation. Mm. So what is the call to action? What is that? How will we, it, how will we embody and be reforming people? And uh, so, because I think that's another, that's another trap, if you will, of sometimes of these kinds of festival days where, uh, where we can get a lot, caught a lot in the glory of the past and what the reformers did. Uh, but if we truly believe in a, an ongoing recovenanting, reforming God, then that pushes us forward and it pushes out it pushes us out to act on that and to be that and to, will people recognize that about us? I think that's one of the challenges for Lutherans right now is will people, do people actually recognize that, that we are, I'll say we, cause I'm a Lutheran, but are, that we are reforming people or, or not. That would be my call to all the Lutherans out there. <laughs> and as a United Methodist, I would call it to all of the Wesleyans as well. Now I'm under pressure. 
Yep. Yes, you are. <laughs> All out to the Presbyterians. I'll speak All to the Reformed the tradition. <laughs> Well, I'll say one more thing, since, you know, we in the Reformed tradition like to uh, hold up the centrality of God, the, um, <laughs> imagine that nobody else does. Uh, no, that I agree with everything you just said there, Caroline. I, I would also want to highlight something that's been an undercurrent, I think, in our conversation about all three of these texts, especially the last three, is that all of these are making statements about the characteristics of God. All of these texts are. And before Reformation is gratitude for the past or before Reformation is sending us off into the future as reforming people, it's also a recognition of a God whose graciousness will shine forth no matter what humanity's best efforts are <laughs> to cover that up or to distort that, which is so crucial because I think there are so many different depictions of God out there in the in the cultural landscape right now, wearing Christian clothing, I think we all have to be a lot more intentional about describing who this God is, lest people who find their ways into our congregations assume it's what they've heard from another church or assume it's what they've seen on TV or, mm -hmm. or whatever. And that's not to become overly, I don't know, adversarial, but it is to carve out that sense of missions got our mission our understanding of our mission as a people as a congregation has to be founded on the character of god and here you've got a god who well who discloses god's own righteousness which is not moral purity i think but it is actually god's power to redeem and to secure and to protect and to save the world which is precisely what paul is saying here you know it's it's not moral purity it's not works but it's the confidence the faith in the grace of God.